thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, big shift from uh, Intuit to water. Just to let you know, water scarcity is a huge issue in the world, one of the biggest problems we are having. And this problem is not going away uh, that easily, partly because the population is growing, people moving to these urban areas. We have competing environmental de uh, demands. Uh, we have learned over time that we can just harness the water that, that there is. We have to leave some for the... Um, for uh, the fish and everything else in the environment, and also climate change is definitely exacerbating this problem. On top of that, we have aging infrastructure that's even further causing problem in this system. So my slides are moving by themselves. I'm not sure what's going on. But you know, they want to go fast. I guess we're uh, running out of time a little bit. Um, just and, the, and if you think about it, for I'm sure in the past, past year at least, you have read a lot about droughts and water scarcity in different parts of the world. And this is not a California or US problem, but it's actually a really growing problem in the world. And um, one thing I, I, what, what I want to focus on today is we had a very specific mindset in the 20th century to deal with water. Uh, we built centralized large infrastructure that was supposed to bring water to us and deal with access to water. And a lot of this was actually did two things was uh, very much prominent in this approach. One was that uh, we assume there's abundance of water. As soon as we run out of one source, we can just go and tap to another one. And another one was we assumed we will always have rain and snow to help us you know, meet our future demand. And the reality is, if I don't know how many of you looked at the newspaper today, but this has been the driest February uh, ever in, the, uh, in California for 150 years, right? So we have not even received a drop of precipitation. Um, and um, OK, so they started just to go away. Um, uh, anyway, the driest uh, year, and that is actually a big issue. Um, OK, so the problem with this kind of approach, which is top down, we'll build infrastructure and people will come, is that humans are not part of this process. So is the environment. We can't really tap into the environment forever. The reality is we have eco ecosystems that are dying. So we need to change this approach or at least look at it differently. The problem is we know this is not going to be sustainable, but look, this, is, this map shows the number of dams that are being built right now uh, at this moment, either uh, under construction or planned to be built in the world. And you can see that the whole uh, centralized large infrastructure dam building process is not really coming to an end, and it's actually growing. Um, now, if, if this was a business and I was running it, I would have said, okay, is the demand really there? Am I building this, these dams for the right reason? Or is it just because this is how I was taught to deal with this issue? This is a supply chain issue. Now I want to walk to you through the how water demand has changed over time. This is the water demand for the city of Seattle. The, uh, the black line shows how the demand has changed since the 1940s. And all the dotted lines shows the forecast for water demand for the city of Seattle. One thing you should remember is that since the 40s, the city of Seattle's population has grown, has doubled actually. It was about 300,000 people. Now it's more than 700,000 people. And look at the water demand, look at the black line. And what you see is even though the population has more than doubled, the water demand hasn't changed that much. We have uh, really progressed in the way we use water. We have technologies that are using a lot, uh, that help us to use less water, different fixtures, different rules, and actually regulations that were put in place. So water demand is not really going up, even though population is growing, and our economic wealth and well-being is growing. And if this was a business that I was running and I was so off the whole time predicting what's coming next, I would have invested in all sort of wrong solutions, right? The next big this, the next big that, because I was expecting this water use to be doubled or tripled over time. This is not a Seattle issue. This is actually very common 
all across the U.S., and I put some examples here for you. Uh, you often hear Southern California and Los Angeles as a way of uh, when people talk about water, but actually very similar story. Their populations had doubled, but their water use hasn't changed at all. So this means that actually that approach that I'm going to go bring water to people as the population grows is not really a sustainable way of thinking about water. And we have to incorporate this human dimension and human dynamics into the decision making process and also need to consider this feedback loop in our decision making. Okay. So, my team actually works on trying to, uh, to better understand this human dynamics and better understand how people's water use is changing over time and how that would eventually impact water infrastructure or infrastructure planning in the long run. Um, I'm going to bring you, I, I'm going to talk about one example here um, large landscape irrigation actually and how people are using it. So, this is a map of uh, green uh, grass, the amount of grass we have in the U.S., lawns in the U.S. So you might probably have not had guessed, but we, the, the biggest crop we are growing in the U.S. is lawns, <laughs> okay? Last time I remember I ate lawns was, I can't even remember. So we don't even need them. We just like them because it's leisurely, it's beautiful. We like to look outside and see how nice it is. But the reality is they use four times more water than corn, okay? And they use, and we are growing them everywhere. And, and the Western US is actually, um, which is a very dry region, it's, it sort of trying very hard to use enough, come up with enough water to make this happen. But actually, I was having a conversation with someone from Michigan that were telling me exactly the same thing. So it's, I guess it's not a Western US problem at all. Um, so I'm going to bring you down to California. And in, Cal in California, we actually, 50% of our water is used in outdoor spaces. Uh, about 34% of that in the household, how, uh, residential buildings, but 10% of that water is used for landscape irrigation. And landscape irriga large landscape irrigation is basically is, um, all the malls and institutional buildings, and if you live in a large HOA building, all the grass that you, they maintain for you, that's how much, that's, those are the spaces we, we call large landscape. And for California, this is about 0.9 million acre feet per year. Now, what does that mean? That is the amount of water 2 million households, not people, households can use for one year. We use that much water to maintain all this manicured, beautiful grass, okay? So if we can sh shave off some of that water, that can go a long way, right? So we, want, we were very interested to see how such a, what kind of conservation behavior do we see in this kind of spaces, and is there a way we can sort of use that as a way of planning for future infrastructure. This, the story I'm going to tell you is going to be from the city of Redwood City, right off uh, north of uh, Stanford. Um, they're actually, the reason we work with them is because they have smart meters, which collect data every 15 minutes. They send data to people, and, um, and also they collect that data information on water use per, um, per uh, meter. And um, very in interestingly enough, they also have invested in recycling. So they have a recycling plant that, that recycles the water, and that water is provided to uh, some of their customers for their outdoor water use. And remember, we are talking about large landscapes, right? So for the outdoor water use. So we had a very nice, nice experiment without us necessarily needing to select people. They have a group of people that receive water from the tap, port portable water, and we have another group of people that receive water from, um, from recycling plants. And these two groups actually, uh, during the recent drought in California, how many of you remember we had a huge drought in California just recently, right? So this is from 2013, 2016, and um, and it was, a, it was a very severe drought, and a lot of people, especially outdoor water use, was under restriction. They were try, there was a lot of effort to try to make people use less water. And people who actually, in this specific experiment that we have, 
um, people who had access to recycling water, recycled water, they were not under restriction. They were actually encouraged to use water because this was the infrastructure that they missed, the city invested in. It's expensive to run it. They want to sell this product. Again, remember, water is a product that's being sold, so they want people to buy that product because it's expensive to generate that recycled water. However, the portable water that was coming from natural sources, it was under restriction. Now, interestingly enough, these people were under the same re different regimes or restrictions. However, they were receiving the same kind of information overall. Actually, Fanny gave a very interesting talk earlier this morning, which talked about knowledge and how much information we gain and how do we make decisions. We actually, during that period in California, we, we, there was a lot of media coverage of the drought in California. It was a period of calm. Tons of uh, articles were being written uh, on this issue. We actually developed a search algorithm that basically scraped the web for all the articles that had been written called Articulate. And what you see here, actually, the blue line shows the Google searches. How many people went online and searched, is, the California, in, is California in drought? Is the drought over? What are conservation? Different, different ter search terms. And the, uh, and the red line shows the, um, shows the, the number of articles that was written. And you actually saw that little uh, red and blue on the bottom in the previous slide too. That basically shows if California, if it's in red, it's in a drought, if it's in blue, if it's, it's in a wet year or a normal year. So these people were under the same regime, uh, different regimes for water restrictions, but they were actually under the same amount of information bombardment from the media. And interestingly enough, if you look at the, one, the, the, the bar charts, they're below zero because they're conserving water, so they're using less water. So the blue ones are the people who are using portable water, and the purple ones are people who are using recycled water. And what you see is, even though the recycled water users were encouraged to use more water, they still saved, right? They did not use the, the same amount of water they used to because they were actually receiving this information that we are in a drought, we should change our behavior. In another interesting way of looking at this was basically looking at uh, neighborhood norms. Again, this is the city of Redwood City, and you can see the, the group in the bottom on the left, red part, are people who mostly receive portable water for their outdoor space, and the people in the corner top, right, top left are the ones who are receiving uh, recycling water. And, and those, um, the, the get it or statistic basically shows how people are changing their behavior based on their neighborhood norms. And here what you are seeing is, Recycled water people are also saving. And not only they're saving, over time, this, this movement is growing, right? Now, they are blue versus red, because port remember, portable water people were under restriction to, save, to use less water, right? So they were saving a lot more. But even the blue shows, even though they were not under restriction, they were still saving water. We could not have done this if, and if we did not have access to all that data and haven't done a lot of work in matching different, uh, uh, different uh, uh, the, you know, buildings and different units to, diff to the meters, to the data, to all these different pieces. This would not have been possible. And I really appreciate the, um, the, the earlier talk, the fact that you know, Stanford's um, uh, parallel computing and cluster computing was extremely useful for making these things happen quickly. Um, so as you see, as the years go by, more people start saving and this neighborhood norms grows. The last thing about this talk that I wanted to give, that the, about this uh, study that I want to talk to you about, is about how income had impact in the way people saved water and how their behavior changed over time. So 2014 was very dry, and the, the blue line that you see shows the trend in water conservation, you see that people were saving, but not that much. By 2014, we had a lot of restriction in place on how much water people should use. So you see there's a drop in water use in that line. And then by 2016, some of the restrictions were lifted. However, and, 
However, some people in a lower income communities or some of the uh, you know, less high income people continued saving water. However, you see in the affluent neighborhoods, the water use started going back up. That's why you see there's a, there's a slope in that, in that blue line at the end. Okay, so this was, a, this was an example to show you. What, one thing I would say is um, what, when you go back and look at these people, you see some of these water use never comes back because people go replace their lawns by actually native uh, uh, landscaping or they just get rid of all their lawns and do other things with their space. And that means that they're structurally changing the way they use water, okay? So that means that we, instead of building a recycling plan and asking people to use water, maybe we should actually more closely look how we can make them use less water. So basically moving from uh, supply side management to demand side management, which is more driven by how humans make decisions and how those decisions can impact our long-term sustainability. Water scarcity is not going to go away. It's one of the world's most pressing problems. And I, I know Margot and I were talking yesterday and she wanted me to talk about how these kind of things impact people. And I would say the biggest, the, the commun disadvantaged communities and underserved communities are the ones that are most impacted by these decisions. Because as we build more large centralized infrastructure, the cost of water goes up. So somebody has to pay for that. So everybody needs to pay for that. And also on top of that, they are the one who at the end end up having problems with access to clean water. With that, um, I hope I'm, ha I'm here. I'm happy to, help the, to answer any other questions you may have, but I appreciate being here. Thank you so much, Nusa. <laughs>